Greetings to everyone. My name is Patrick Griffin. This is December 16th, 2020. And I want to tell you a very short story about a friend of mine named Victor. And every detail of this story was re related to me by Victor himself, who also gave me written authorization to use his story. And where I want to pick up is after Victor had graduated from high school, he grew up in a fairly nice neighborhood in Riverside County, never had been in any kind of trouble with the law, had a good job and was looking forward to being promoted into management in the place where he worked. He was engaged to his high school sweetheart whom he loved very much, strong family support, and things were looking really good in his life. There was just one area in Victor's life that he did not want to take seriously, did not want to deal with. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But what happened with Victor is about 17 months after the day when he received his diploma for graduating from high school, his family and friends all there cheering him on and looking forward to an exciting future for this young man. In late November of 2006, he received a call from a cousin telling him that his cousin's wife had just given birth to a baby, a baby boy. And Victor said on the phone, this calls for a celebration. So Victor and his cousin decided to meet at an aunt and uncle's house and have a time to celebrate. They went over to the house and each of them stopped along the way and purchased a bunch of Mickey's malt liquors. So they sat in the garage and drank the Mickey malt liquors and swapped stories and were just having a great time. Well, about six in the evening, Victor's cousin called for a relative to come and pick him up to take him home, which was a wise decision on the cousin's part to not try to drive under those kind of conditions. They were both very drunk by that time. And after the cousin left, Victor was just there alone and finished off uh, another Mickey. And then he got a call from his fiance, who was doing some shopping, early Christmas shopping at a nearby mall. And right away, his fiance could tell that he was drunk. And she started to try to talk to him about that, telling him something like, Victor, this is starting to happen too much. Uh, he didn't want to hear that. He tried to tell her, I'm not drunk. And she said, I know you're drunk and you better not get into that truck in this condition. Well, the conversation was starting to turn into an argument so Victor's girlfriend said, look, I'm coming over there right now. And she hung up. Well, Victor didn't want to have to deal with her. He knew that the mall was only a couple freeway exits away. So he grabbed a fresh Mickey and ran out to his truck, jumped in and hit the road with no particular destination, not really paying much attention to where he was going and not paying a whole lot of attention to the road itself. And at one point as he's driving along, he takes a big swig from his Mickey. And when he looks down, he sees that the light had turned yellow, but he's still a little distance away. So he punched it. And then he saw the light turn red, but he was already going too fast and was too close. So he just went in. And the next thing Victor remembers is hearing a little electronic beeping sound, just a little beep beep, beep, and he tried focusing his eyes and he noticed that there was a tube coming out of his left arm leading up to a bottle on a pole by the side of his bed. He was in a hospital and he tried to put his right hand up to his face, but it yanked back on him. He realized he was handcuffed to the bed. So he just laid back in the pillow trying to process all this, trying to remember, trying to put it together. And he remembered, it started coming back to him, the red light, the intersection, 
But after that, in his memory, he could not see anything. But he was able to remember the sounds of shattering glass and crunching metal. Well, right about then, from his left side, a doctor walked up. He said the doctor was tall, an older man with a long face, and Victor looked up at him and said, what happened? And the doctor looked down at him with droopy eyes and said, you've had a very terrible accident, but you'll be okay. Well, right about then, two other men walked up from the right side and the doctor left. One of the men on the right side was an officer in uniform and the other was a man wearing a suit. And he identified himself as a representative of the district attorney's office. And the man in the suit said to Victor, I have some questions I want to ask you, but first the officer's going to read you your rights. Well, after the officer did what he had to do, Victor didn't wait for the man in the suit to say anything else. He just jumped right out and said, did I hit someone? And the man said, yes. And Victor just stared at him. Their eyes were just locked together. And Victor said, is the person hurt? And the man said, yeah. And Victor said, bad? And the man nodded his head. And then Victor asked if there was more than one person. The man said, yes, there were two. So for a moment, Victor was thinking in his mind that maybe they're just trying to scare him. Maybe this is one of those tactics where they just want to teach him a lesson by putting fear into him. But as he stared at the man, it started setting into his mind that no, something really bad has happened. And he said to the man, how bad are they hurt? And the man in the suit leaned his face in real close to Victor and he said, they're dead. And when those words crashed into Victor's ears, everything in Victor's brain changed. His whole way of thinking about himself, about life, about the world. In one moment, he had gone from being just a happy teenager who liked to party a little bit on the weekends to being a murderer. And after the officer and the deputy DA left the hospital room, Victor just broke down crying, bawling like a baby. Nobody who loved him or cared about him could be there to help him. And his crying was uncontrollable. And he never imagined that he could feel so lost, so alone, and so scared. Well, a few months later, when his day came to be in court, there was a 15-year-old girl who was a witness. She had seen the crime. And she had ran up to the car that Victor had crashed into. And as the teenage girl was on the stand and Victor sitting there on a chair, not too far from the stand watching her talk, the girl was describing how when she ran up to the car, the passenger door was open and there was a woman crumpled over in the seat. And the girl became very emotional as she's on the stand. She said, I waved my hand in front of the woman's eyes. Her eyes were open and she was just staring. But when I waved my hand in front of her eyes, she didn't blink, her eyes did not move. And, and then the girl on the stand said, I realized in my mind that this woman is dead. And those words that the teenage witness spoke on the witness stand, they stick in Victor's mind to this day. He had killed two elderly people who were grandparents. They had adult children and grandchildren. Victor took away a lot from people who had done no wrong to him. He was sentenced to life in prison. 
He's now in his mid-30s, recently went to what is called a parole hearing, where he sits in front of a commissioner and a deputy commissioner who are responsible for making decisions on when to release a person from prison. And he was given a five-year denial, which means he has to wait five more years before he even has a chance to be considered to be paroled. And I want to read to you the last paragraph of Victor's story, which, as he told it to me, he says here, it was not an accident, it was crime. When I took the wheel drunk, I showed how little I cared for the safety and welfare of others. I turned my vehicle into a deadly weapon while giving no thought to the innocent people I was putting at risk. I can say, I am sorry, and I really am, but that does not undo what others have suffered for my criminal choice to drive while drunk. So what I would like to leave you with, well, by the way, I want to mention that I wrote all together seven, seven different stories of men who were doing life sentences in state prison for killing people while driving drunk. Some of these men had no criminal backgrounds at all. One was in college studying to be a doctor. There was Peter and James and Chris and Roger. There's just multiple. There's so many people in prison right now as we speak who had no criminal history but had this one problem in their lives that they refused to deal with drinking and driving. And so what I want to leave you with is just this question. If you get behind the wheel with your mind compromised by the influence of any foreign substance and you know that you're rolling the dice with other people's lives, what is the difference in moral principle between you and the road killer in prison? I urge you to give some thought to that before it's too late. If you don't want to take it seriously, you want to keep thinking this is just something that happens to other people, that you'll be more careful, I guarantee you there's a prison cell waiting for you. There's decades of living with agony, regret, and helplessness to go back and unchange the past. So if you're living a basically good life, but you got this one issue, you like to get in that car and drive when you're under the influence, I hope you will remember the story of Victor and all the other road killers serving life in state prison.